Okay, let's go ahead and start talking about another topic <clears throat> related to knife edge diffraction. And that is the practical applications of the formulas that we've developed so far. Uh, we're going to talk about one thing in particular, uh, and that is basically how to derive Fresnel zones from the diffraction formula. And that'll help us uh, talk about the practical behavior of a lot of these diffraction problems. So let's start with our old result here from the previous uh, lecture. <clears throat> we said that the electric field is equal to the magnitude of the incident field from the source. And keep in mind our source is over here. There's some sort of protrusion, the knife edge. And there's some point of observation over here. This total distance here is R naught plus R. And of course, this is my clearance distance D. Negative D indicates protrusion into the sight line between source and observation point. So I basically have one over distance attenuation, just like a good spherical wave from a source. I have linear phase taper minus JK distance along this line. And then over here, I have those Fresnel integral function terms that we developed in the previous lectures and our handy constructs for diffraction formulas, as we'll see again in this class. So let's just check to make sure. Uh, well, no, first let's <clears throat> turn this into a slightly different form. Instead of E field, let's talk about power. And most optical and RF engineers like to deal with power instead of field theory because it makes a little bit more intuitive sense to talk about watts instead of volts per meter. And so to get this formula, power of course is proportional to the magnitude of E field quantity squared. Now keep in mind E field squared is volt squared per meter squared. Of course, power is watts, and I would technically need meter squared per ohms to get to watts. And this is really what the antenna does. It has an electromagnetic aperture, which collects power, meter squared, and it has some sort of intrinsic impedance associated with it to interface with a circuit and deliver that power to a circuit. Uh, so, to go from E field to watch, you really need to know about receiver and antenna hardware. However, we can make us some assumptions about matching and things like that and use a Frist type formula by just basically squaring this and substituting uh, EIRP or transmit power times gain of the transmitter <coughs> for our E naught squared term. And so that gives us power received is equal to transmit power gain of transmitter, gain of receiver, lambda squared, for our total distance r squared, where r, capital R, is r plus r naught. And that looks exactly like the Frisk free space transform, uh, transfer function. But over here, we've got this diffraction loss term. And this is what's doing all of the work in our formulation here. Uh, it's got all the co uh, cosine um, integral terms and sine integral terms for our Fresnel integrals and d cosine theta and the square root of an argument in each of these. We're basically just taking the magnitude squared of this term and bringing this 2 down along for the ride, squaring that, hopefully simplifying some things. Now, let's just do a quick sanity check to make sure that it checks out. So, over here, 
I've got my source geometry with the diffracting knife edge. If my D goes to infinity, that is my obstructing knife edge is infinitely far away from the sight line, we know that these functions in the limit of large argument converge to both positive one half. And if that's the case, then I have one half plus one half, that's one quantity squared. This term goes from one half to one half, one quantity squared. I add those two terms together, I get two, and that cancels with the half I have out in front here. And what I'm left with is the first free space formula. Now, if instead D goes negative and starts jutting into the sight line, now I'm flipping the sign. These things are going to asymptotically approach negative one half each. One half minus one half approaches zero. It's going to be a very small value. Likewise, this term, when I add them together, I'm going to get a very small term, and that introduces a tremendous amount of loss in the diffraction term, which makes sense as I start to cut this deep. The waves simply don't bend around as well as uh, when you have shallower angles. So, so recall this geometrical relationship that we have. We developed it in the, the class last time. We said that if you take this distance here, which is r naught plus r, Oh. and you subtracted from the, that from this total distance here from source to sight line uh, to diffracting edge back to observation point which we gave a nice expression for over here source to edge, edge to observation point, you get a value that we call delta r, which we could express almost exclusively um, that inner term of the Fresnel integral functions in terms of delta r. In other words, you can make the argument depend entirely on delta r and none of the other parameters. Now, that's kind of interesting, because consider, what do I get if I say delta r is equal to the constant c? What edges of the diffracting component here lie on a constant delta r? Well, remember, delta r is the difference between path length from here to here minus this constant distance across here. The difference in path length, the points that lie on a constant path length like this, trace out an ellipse. That's the mathematical definition of an ellipse. You draw a point from focus one to a point and back to another focus, and whatever points here create a constant total length there lie on an ellipse. And so this is an interesting construct because what it says is that regardless of where I put my diffracting edge, first of all, it doesn't matter where it points, what the angle is, you can have an angle like this, I have an angle like this. You can make it straight up and down like this. I can make it straight up and down like this. Or this, or this, or this, or any of these. All of these wind up giving you the same kind of loss which is a really interesting result. And that leads to some practical behavior too. So what we're gonna do is divide our problem up. We're gonna have a source, we're gonna have a point of observation, and we're going to divide, uh, define ellipses around these div uh, points such that delta r is equal to n lambda over 2. So the first 
ellipse. We're going to call that the first Fresnel zone. And that's going to basically satisfy this equation right here. Delta R is going to be less for the first Fresnel zone. Delta R is going to be less than or equal to lambda over 2. We're going to draw another ellipse around there. And I've kind of drawn that with dotted lines a little bit better down here. That's going to be the second Fresnel zone. Delta R is going to be less than or equal to lambda greater than or equal to lambda over 2. So this was number 1 in here. If I follow this dotted gray ellipse line. And this is going to be number 2 here and here. It's going to be number 3. number four, and number five, zone five. Now this is a really helpful way to think of diffraction, dividing the region up into Fresnel zones, because what these zones are basically saying is these are regions of similar influence in the Fresnel formulation. So here I've got a copy of a graph that I showed in an earlier lecture where we calculate clearance distance. This particular one is in wavelengths for another 100 wavelength type of uh, radiated link. And we graph the field amplitude normalized against E0. And what we see is down zero, of course, is the knife edge is just starting to poke into this sight line right up to the edge and so as I pull that knife edge away I see the field go up then down and up then down then up then down and asymptotically approaches what the free uh, free space value should be okay well, that's good we got a nice Fresnel zone map these red lines here are the Fresnel zones demarcations from that elliptical analysis. And I have the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, the seventh one, all um, laid out. What's interesting about this is that it gives you a really helpful rule of thumb for blockages. And this is something that microwave engineers use all the time. Take a look from here over to here, I have a sight, nice open sight line. I will start to get significant degradations well before a blockage gets into the optical sight line for this type of uh, radiated link. The reason why that's an issue is because I basically want to keep my uh, protrusions outside of the fir first Fresnel zone. If I'm outside of the first Fresnel zone, I start to oscillate and approach that uh, optical sight line limit. In fact, in some cases, I even get a little bit of a constructive interference boost. In some cases, I get a little destructive interference boost. But here, all of a sudden, once I get too far into this first Fresnel zone, the field and the power falls off the table. So you'll often hear rules of thumb where you try to clear the first Fresnel zone in all of your blockages when you're designing some sort of point-to-point -point optical or point-to-point -point RF link. And you may also hear certain rules of thumb where uh, an engineer may say, well, you can get about 30% into the first Fresnel zone. And if you have an obstruction like that, like a tree somewhere, if you do the measurement carefully, you can estimate how badly that's going to diffract and obstruct your link. What's interesting is because these are el ellipses, uh, something that is actually farther away from the center of the link 
can influence things worse than something that might be closer to the sight line but is still very close in to the radiated wave. So, there you have it. A very useful formula or a useful rule of thumb for designing radiated links and making sure they have clearance and diffraction. <clears throat> One other thing to mention is that these ellipses in 3D are actually ellipsoids. So if I were to take a cut through here, slice it out, I would have a first Fresnel zone, a second Fresnel zone, a third Fresnel zone, and a fourth Fresnel zone. And what's particularly interesting about that is you can see here that these zones have different levels of constructive and destructive interference. So for example, if I left this zone intact but then blocked uh, through here I would be allowing the constructive interference through and the destructive interference would be suppressed and then uh, over here if I leave this positive component intact and I got rid of this component I would have again the positive constructive Thing, the thing that's going to give me phase at my obser constructive interference at this point of observation. And then I would get rid of the component that's destructively interfering there. That's an interesting behavior that you can think about in three dimensions when you start looking at this type of problem. So. With that, we're going to take a break from physical optics, and our next set of lectures will actually start looking at the Sommerfeld diffraction problem. <laughs>